Boxing Corner Casuals Podcast. My name is Paolo. I've got a very, very special guest with me today. Um, former boxer, um, pundit, currently a pundit, former footballer. She's done everything. Stacey Copeland, how are you? Um, it's, it's a pleasure to get you on today. I've, I've wanted to do this interview for so long. Um, I think I've seen you at uh, the Nielsen card working with oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Fighters yeah. on TV. So I saw you yeah. there. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Um, as I said, for everyone that doesn't know, the first ever British woman to win the British woman to win the Commonwealth title. Um, massive achievement. We will go into it shortly, but Stacey, how are you doing? I'm good. Just got back off um, yeah. a really good bike ride. Um, <laughs> just trying to squeeze a few grapes in here just to stop from That's passing. That's all right. Really Don't worry about it. Yeah, no, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, really yeah. well. It's interesting because obviously, um, and we go, we can go into it shortly, but I, it, it's something that obviously I wanted to mention as well. You've done so much in your career as a, like a professional athlete. When you look at it in the grand scheme of things, boxing, football as well. Um, where did where did it begin for you? If if, you, if if we could start there with with sort of your passion, because I watched a clip of you uh, talking about this. Um, it was on the YouTube video that I'd seen and you was talking about obviously growing up, there wasn't many people around you to kind of look to, look to for uh, inspiration. There w- It wasn't a thing where girls were seen to be doing sport. And if they were, they were labelled a certain way or a tomboy. And th- these are the labels that you got growing up playing sports. But obviously, fast forward to nowadays where women's sport across the board has grown. Where did it start for you? Obviously, just in terms of the football, the boxing um, and what kind of drove drove you to do that? I think it depends on what sports. I think the thing with me is that I was doing sports that were very much considered for boys yeah. um, in football and boxing. So yeah. I think that's what you know where the stigma came from. I think had I been a girl who chose um, perhaps netball or athletics, I, I don't think I would have hmm. or ice skating or something. I don't think I would have faced the same stigma but um my pathways into both sports were really different um to one another because <clears throat> in football I didn't have any obvious influences in my family nobody really played football not to any level um and so I'm not really sure there wasn't somebody who took me to you know a training session or anything like that it just really came about from school and in mm. the playground at lunch and like playtime was all I wanted yeah. to do <laughs> was play yeah, yeah, football yeah. bizarrely like it, most kids like most kids <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially just, yeah. um, loads of lads and I was the only girl and um I didn't really think much of it to be honest I just thought of it as you know just playing footy with my mates and yeah. then um boxing there were very obvious influences that was a, a whole different story because um my dad uh, was a boxer and my granddad had been a boxer and then you know a coach and ran our gym for you know well in the end over 40 years but he was already running an established gym when I was a kid so that those are my influences and who got me yeah. into boxing you obviously as well because just to touch on it as well you know as a footballer you represented England under 18s um it's a massive achievement just in terms of what you've done playing football then to go over to the boxing it, it's vast because I do you know what I'll be honest with you you know, I know there, there's other examples you can draw from, like Katie Taylor, somebody who obviously grew up playing both. Um, have, her having to fight in Lauren male Price. competition. Lauren Price as well. Um, Katie Taylor having to fight in male competitions growing up uh, just to get com- uh, just to get fights when she was younger. Um, for you as well, in terms of the boxing, have you have you ever seen a massive change since you were boxing to now? It just in terms of the growth of females get uh, sport. If I draw us back to uh, a card, for example, I was at Savannah Marshall and Clarissa Shields, uh, big all-female boxing card at the O2 uh, O2 Arena. Something unheard of 
in terms of in this country that, that they put on something to that magnitude. Um, when you look at where the sport has gone to now, is it, would you say it's excelled to another level? Is there still a lot of work that needs to be done, especially with everything that you're kind of involved with, with your um, charities, um, your punditry as well? You're around this every day. So what's your view on, I would probably just say, the growth in female sport, especially from when you've competed to now? I think the growth, if you're speaking specifically about women's boxing, has mm. been enormous even since I retired, never mind yeah. since I began. I mean, if you're talking about when I very first went in the gym, well, it was illegal for us to box, which I didn't find mm. out till I was 11. Um and me and my little group of mates who, you know, did everything together in the gym. You know, we were always training together. We went to all the shows at the weekend together. We sparred together. You know, had yeah. a really good little group of mates, as you do in, in sport. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, it wasn't until we went to my granddad to say we were ready to box that he sort of explained to me that it was illegal for girls and women. And I, I couldn't believe it. Mm. Um, so if you're talking about from then, then, yeah, vastly different because... Yeah you know, we're allowed to do it for a start. But I think um, the, the latter part, you know, in terms of how it's come on since it's been legal and, and so on, um, even just since I retired, I think COVID was an enormous shift. And that's when I got my injury um, right in the middle of COVID and, and it was over for me. But the way that it's, you know, the trajectory it's been on since then is, is phenomenal mm -hmm. in, in every respect, really. Yeah, because obviously as well, it's for me as well, growing up, the first influential uh, female boxer that I watched was probably Nicola Adams um, from the from specifically here, just in terms of the GB and everything else. Um, but when we talk about, obviously, my all-time, obviously, Katie Taylor's up there for me as a great, just because of what she's done. Um, we talk about some of the younger fighters coming through now, some of my favourites being uh, Maisie Rose, Fran Hennessy, um, these are the kind of up and coming next generation now that uh, I, I'm looking at now as like the next stars. But let me ask you as well, because obviously about that injury that you had during COVID, um, how how was that at a time when, you know, like the world stopped? It, the, the world stopped. Um, and for you, how difficult mentally was it to deal with that injury at a time when everything's stopping around you? Not only just uh, yourself, but the world, sport, uh, life stopped for everyone for five months. Um, mentally, how tough was it for you to get through that? Um, one of the toughest things in my life, without doubt, yeah. it was uh, terrible. It was like a death, 100%. It was like mm. a massive bereavement. And we were due to be back in the gym, uh, me and Brad Ray, uh, with our coach, Blaine Eunice, um, on that Friday. And I got the injury on the Sunday before. I felt like it was... I knew it was serious. And then um, obviously getting into hospitals and stuff was uh, tricky. It was definitely possible if you had a situation like mine, but uh, tricky, you know, you're going on your own and sitting there for hours by yourself and everything. So it's very different to your usual hospital mm. experience um, in that you were completely isolated from everybody else, I mean. Um, and then, yeah, um, it was it, it, the only good thing about it I think in terms of the timing was that I didn't have to tell everybody straight away because nobody questioned why I wasn't in the gym all the time and training yeah. all the time because nobody was unless you were on a show in like Eddie Hearn's back garden or you know one of those that they had in carts started having in car packs whatever unless you were on one of those you weren't fighting anyway nobody was so it meant that people weren't questioning it so it, it it bought me quite a bit of time to have a little bit of a buffer between me knowing and having to tell everybody else, mm. which that denial phase was able to last a wee bit longer. But in every other respect, it was far from ideal because yeah. what I could have done with doing and what I feel like would have helped was really throwing myself into other things straight away. And you couldn't, nobody could. And I think that would have helped me, but it was what it was. Yeah. Um, and it's an ongoing thing, like any death <laughs> or any bereavement, mm. it, it comes mm. back like a sometimes it's like an absolutely massive wave that you know knocks you over and washes over you. And other times it's little 
drops that fall on you, whatever, yeah. and you just have to, you know, get through each wave and then you get, you get fewer and, you know, less as time goes on. So, yeah, that's the, the, what it's kind of felt like for me. I think I think as well, like I've spoken to a, few, a couple of people and a couple of my friends who box as well, um, especially at a pro level, and it's sometimes when they are going through hard stuff, and this is, this is divided in opinion, but some people say that they find it hard to look back on their achievements in a moment when they're grieving because they don't appreciate them as much um, as maybe when they're able to grow and obviously um, out of a specific tough point in their life, sometimes reminiscing on, I think, their past achievements, they probably found them most difficult just because then the, the, the doubt comes into your mind of what what could I have done? And you start getting into sort of old ways of thinking of what, what where you could have been. But I do want do want to highlight a really important moment that, you know, um, the first British women to win the Commonwealth title. It, it, that is a massive achievement in sport. Did you, in boxing specifically, but did you ever kind of look at that, looking at that achievement and isolating that for a minute? Is that something that you looked at um, growing up and that was kind of always a goal for you? Um, did you ever think that, did you ever think that you was going to do it growing up or did you always feel like it was destined, it was going to happen? Um, just on the trajectory you was with boxing. I can't say I wanted to win the Commonwealth title because I wouldn't have known what that was as a kid, but mm. I wanted to be like Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray. <laughs> yeah. You know, I idolised those people. I wanted to be like Rocky. I mean, watching those films as a kid, I thought he was real, like mm. most kids probably do And when they're first mm. watching it. And, you know, me and my dad used to watch, you know, all the Rockies all the time and stuff. And and um, so it's I think as, as a kid, you've got a more vague idea of what you want to do you know you, you yeah. just want to do that um you know that thing whatever that thing might be whether it's kayaking or whatever and you see it for the first time it might be at the olympics it might be old footage you know it might be a film like rocky you know you, you see it the first time and you, you get involved with it and then you just want to do it um you know there might be a certain place you want to do it in boxing it might be madison square garden or whatever and it might be a world title that you want um you know, which just goes to show because I wanted to do all that as a kid and little did I know it wasn't even legal for me. I had no idea <laughs> that it wasn't even legal. So, um, yeah, I think I, I, I can't specifically say when I was a kid I wanted to win the Commonwealth title. Yeah. I wouldn't have known what it was, but I absolutely, my whole life was sport and I never thought it would be any different. No, and that that is interesting. Obviously, you say that because you know the amount of people that watch Rocky films, we included, and even nowadays draw to it as references for Absolutely. real life situations and everything else. Like the, the impact Rocky's had, I think. Well, on. you didn't have, you know, these days, kids. I don't think it were the same for them because there's six million YouTube channels, and then there's Netflix, and then there's Sky, and there's all the outlets who yeah. produce content well every day yeah. but certainly if you look at fight week nowadays for any big fight yeah you're seeing content every single day from those fighters so if for example you're an aj fan a tyson fury fan a katie taylor fan a you know ellie scottney whoever yeah. um you're going to be able to get loads of content that other people produce mm. then alongside that you can follow that person on TikTok, Insta, da, da, da. so these kids are going to get that didn't exist for us. So you had enormous gaps between, you know, in my era, it'd be Ben and Eubank, wouldn't it? Um, you know, those those are the big fights that are on terrestrial television. But obviously, there was massive gaps between those. So you wouldn't yeah. actually see. And then you'd have like snippets on the news, but that was it. Um, so other than all that old footage, that if you had, you know, somebody in your house who had access to all that, like my dad did, because he was a, obviously a big boxing fan, having been a boxer. We, you know, I, I watched loads of old videos, which were actual videos back then of Ali, Sugar Ray, Duran, etc. So I think that's what makes it very, you know, my generation got it that way. These kids now have access to, to everything. everything about everybody they, they like, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're watching, by the time a fighter gets to the weigh-in and gets on the scales, you know, a fan will know every single thing they've been doing every day. You know, they'll have seen the yeah. press conference, they'll have seen what happened after the press conference, what happened in the hotel lobby, and who they had an exchange with, what they've eaten that morning. It, 
because they can go on stories and see everything. So it's going to be it's very different now. It is very different. It's interesting you say that as well because I, I look at so many fighters. Like I think in the modern day era now, if you looked at um, like a, obviously Muhammad Ali is the obvious one, but if he was around in the modern day era with technology Imagine. and everything else. I think he would absolutely break records financially. Yeah, I think he'd have as many followers as Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More, maybe. Yeah, yeah maybe. Oh, maybe, no. no, definitely more. Because, that's you know, when we talk about boxing, definitely the most influential boxer of all time. Um, and, like, when you look at other uh, fighters as well, for me as well, growing up, um, especially if I, I draw to, like, somebody who is Brit like, British, for example, in David Haight, David yes. Hay was somebody that I watched, but then he was he was coming in at a time where everyone watched him. Great boxer, but the ring walks and everything else. But this was pre Instagram, pre yeah. all of it, and so all of these things that are making fighters obviously rising their profiles up, getting them seen by promoters nowadays. He didn't have, and I always question somebody who was marketable like David Hay, how big he would have been if he was fighting today in his prime with everything he had access to. I mean, yeah. like I said, there was stuff around like YouTube, but it was, it was different. It wasn't used in the same capacity it's used now. It's interesting to see how many fights have sort of been not made because obviously there's all the legalities and all that paperwork, but sort of um, the, 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 the seeds have been sown on Twitter or Instagram. Yeah. See yeah. it time and time again, don't we? Because anybody can call anybody out and fighters can either ignore it or they can reply and engage, and then suddenly they've got public interest and people want to see it. And then well, there's yeah. a, that's there's what I mean. You look at you look at um, just random ones like Javante Davis and Conor Ben just going at yeah. it on Twitter, yeah. and that, that creates obviously public interest. You're right. Yeah. It's interesting. I, do you know what I want to I want to bring something up that you said as well, just mainly about what you stand for and what you do. But it's a quote quote from Stacy. I'm going to call it. So here we go. Um, the thing that I'm always most proud of in sport is make, it may inspiring and making a difference to somebody else's life. The thing that drives me, no matter the job, uh, no matter what the job is, um, and you want to have a positive influence in people's life, especially obviously females uh, in sport growing up because of what you've done, but generally, that's kind of the outline of the quote. Why, why is that important to you? Um, because you're using it as a base for what you do. Why is that so important? It's just the, the thread that runs through everything I do. So I've had a real variety of jobs, and I still have, actually. So obviously, I'd, you know, being a competitive athlete, yeah. um, which, you know, in football terms, I, I did here. Then I, I played in America for five years, mm -hmm. I played in Sweden. So I moved around with that. And then <clears throat> with boxing, I visited lots and lots of different places. Um you know, meanwhile, in the background, I was, I'd, I'd worked in a school full time. Um, mm. but then I do public speaking. N now I don't work at the school any longer, but, you know, I do public speaking in businesses, in prisons, in all sorts of different places. I work in radio. So that's regular daytime radio or presenting the sport. Then, as you say, in the boxing terms, you know, I've done some commentary, some, you know, anchoring the sport, a bit of punditry, a real yeah. mix of all sorts of things. But the, so they're all very varied, but the, the theme that runs through it for me is making a positive difference and using sport for good. Um, is obviously they're all very different skill sets and different ways that you have to approach them, but that's always been the thread. Whatever job I've done or sport or volunteering, whatever it might be, uh, that's always been at the heart of it. Um, mm. And, you know, people have different reasons for, you know, the things that they do uh for me it's, it's just part of who i am i think um i mean obviously there's, there's reasons you could really go into but um you know suffice to say it's just it's just who i am and i'm very lucky that i've got loads and loads of energy um, yeah. and you know a big heart and the two together are good they lend themselves to being able to make a positive difference and i'm just really lucky that the thing that i happened to love is one of the most powerful things on the planet for making a difference, which of course is sport. Yeah, sport sport is the center of everything. It, it, it can bring people together. It can. It, it's got it's got so many languages. Sport, I think, when you look at it across the board. Um, and I think obviously being a fan of sport, boxing, football, wh whatever it may be, athletics, 
it, it brings people together. I think that's the main thing as well when we talk about sport is how many people it brings together, communities, people from different walks of life, different backgrounds. Um, it, it's it's inclusive to everyone, uh, sport. And that's probably one of the reasons I enjoy it so much. Um, let me ask you a question as well. BBC, uh, Sky, Fight, Fight Zone TV, you've, you've worked on all of these uh, broadcasting platforms. How... That's that's a massive change, obviously, from when you was competing, when you was fighting, when you was playing football. Um, how was that transition going into a media world? Because that's that that is very different to obviously doing it and play playing sport. And there's so many other aspects of it. And media is um, something that you know you you're, you're kind of thrown into the deep end, or you're put in front of camera for, um, and you have to be ready. How did you find that transition going over? You enjoyed obviously doing it, but how was there any sort of nervousness starting off? Um, how how was that transition going into it? I mean, I still get nervous depending on what it is. You know, if it's something I haven't done before or it's on a mm. bigger scale. Um, the very first time um, I presented our um, sports programme from Wembley, um, I was nervous because I'd, I'd never, you know, I'd never done that before. And it's a, yeah. it's a huge occasion. It's a big stadium. It, is a big, it felt like a big deal and it was a big deal. Um, so... And then, you know, from that point of view, you, you want to make sure that, you know, for, you know, that both sets of fans, but particularly when it's regional radio, it's, you know, one set of fans that are, are going to be, you know, supporting whatever team's playing there. Apart from when it was the Manchester United, Manchester City, Men's FA Cup final, and it's for BBC Radio Manchester, it's half and half. But, you know, you want to do the best job for them as well. You want to, you know, for those who can't be there, you want to really make them feel like they're a part of it, um, make them feel every emotion possible, yeah. convey the sights, the smell, the sounds, and just you want to do the best job for them so it mm. feels like they're there. Um, and, you know, I think there's so much, well, not even so much, everything that I've learned in sport has been applicable to other areas of my life yeah. at some point, uh, this included. So... When it's been a matter of feeling those nerves, it's been a matter of what I would have done for, um, it, you know, when, when I was getting nervous about a fight, just to go back to the basics of, you know, what's my focus, what are my tactics, take confidence from the fact that I know I've put the training in, listen to my coach, etc. So, you know, in this case, you listen to your producer, you make sure you've really prepared well and you can trust that preparation. Um, and then you look at, you know, rather than, feeling the pressure and letting it overwhelm you you feel gratitude that you're in that situation and ultimately the, the be all and end all for me when I get really nervous about anything uh, like I used to do about boxing is I used, I used to think to myself if right now like those moments when the nerves are surging through your veins like electricity and you know you're having all the physical effects of it you, your stomach's churning getting a dry mouth your legs feel wobbly you feel dizzy the panic starting in, in your head, shallow breathing, all of those effects, and it's really got a grip of you. I would say to myself, if somebody was to come into this changing room right now and say, the fight's off, is that what I would want? And the answer was always no. <laughs> no, 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 hell no, get me in there. And then I'd be able to switch back on. And that's what I do now. And I was get dead nervous about, you know, like doing a you know a big event or whatever. Yeah. Would you rather not be here? No, I absolutely want to be here. And then that's when yeah. that athlete mentality, that competitive, whatever it is, you know, whatever you want to call it, people call it different things, but it kicks in. I think it's interesting you say that. I've done commentary specifically for live TV or it was the, the, the boxing show I was working on was being live streamed for the first time ever in my life. And I found when I was sitting down and I put the headphones on and I'm talking to the MZ who I'm doing it with, um, I'm finding myself panicking, asking a lot of questions, but my legs shaking, like my legs non-stop like under the table. I think my friend, there's a photo of it somewhere on my friend and you just see my leg bouncing like that. And I always do it when I'm nervous. But then I think, I suppose you're in the situation now. <laughs> it's gone live. It, it, for me, I look at it in the thing of, I can't, I've, got, I've just got to face it head on. I'm, I'm there now. If it's, you know, if I get nervous now, I suppose you, when you're in the moment, 
you it's, it takes a split couple of seconds to deal with it but i do think it teaches you a lot it teaches you how to be on camera how to how to uh, conduct yourself as well and i think you can transfer that into all areas of life it was the scariest thing i ever done but i think since i've done it um you know it it's it's opened me doors to be able to do it again and again and I, I, it's something that i'm not afraid of now if that makes yeah. sense um yeah. but uh, it was hard at first yeah yeah de definitely yeah it is. um i've got a question for you obviously as well before we go because i know you've taken a lot of a little time out of your working day and i do appreciate this um your advice to anyone be it media boxing but specific, um, getting into all of those fields now if someone's watching this now a younger kid uh just drawing for inspiration, listening to everything that we're saying today, what would be your advice to them as they're stepping into either boxing, stepping into uh, getting into media, football? What's the bit of advice that you can give and that you can pass down just from the knowledge that you've got that you can give to somebody else? I think um, it's really difficult to give other people advice because we all sort of, we're all receptive in different ways. And really... Mm -hmm. There's nothing, well, very little that's more powerful than experience and going through things yourself um, and learning from those experiences. That's really where, you know, the yeah. real nuggets of learning happen. But um, to answer the question in, in some way, um, I think definitely something that could apply to everything since you've asked about boxing and media or whatever else would be to take responsibility um, that, you know, in boxing terms, it's down to you to make weight. If you've said you're going to be at that weight, then you ought to be. Um, and yeah. you ought to do it in a way that's safe and doesn't put yourself at risk. So be, you know, disciplined when you need to be. Um, yeah. And take responsibility for it. Your fitness, you've got to take responsibility for that. Um, your own mind, you've got to take responsibility for. So if you're having doubts or you've got a, a nemesis, like, you know, some people have, a big worry about a southpaw or, or this type of fighter, that type of fighter, or boxing in that place or whatever. Mm. That's your responsibility as well to deal with those little gremlins mentally, etc. And if you do have something that you know, like a, an athlete might say, it's the nerves. The nerves are just cut. Well, that's your responsibility too. Find out how to overcome that. Read books, sports psychology books. They're so helpful. I wish I'd have mm. discovered those when I was younger because they were immensely helpful. Um, or speak to somebody with that experience or that knowledge and insight that can help you. Don't just say, I struggle with A, B and C without taking responsibility for trying to do something about it. Mm. And it's exactly the same on the media side. You know, put put the work in on your own side and be responsible for the things that you, you can do. Um, and, you know, the confidence and hopefully the opportunities will come from it. Um, the second thing, I'll just give three things. The first would be to take responsibility. Um, the second thing would be to just keep in mind that comparison is the thief of joy and it's very damaging. So whilst it can definitely be helpful to look at another fighter, uh, particularly those that are doing really well, and look closely at what it is they do well, so whether that's their lifestyle choices what they do in the gym, what they do on fight day and fight night, all those little 1% that can help you be better, absolutely take that on board. Likewise, fighters that don't get it right, don't do it then, learn from it and make sure that you avoid that. Same in media, when you listen to commentators that you admire and you think are good, what can you take from what they do without trying to be them, because you have to be yourself, what little bit structurally, you know, technically can you take from them? But comparing yourself directly is never helpful so looking mm. at somebody and saying i'm miles better than them is you know you, that's your ego talking and it's not helpful likewise saying god everybody's better than me i'm never going to be that good so then you've just got to watch your mind and check yourself especially as we've discussed in this age of social media where yeah. before you've even had breakfast you're going to be exposed to 50 people saying get after it let's go smash it and then another 50 people saying be zen Chill out, did it? It's dead confusing. So you have to know what you what <laughs> like, <laughs> that's it's literally not, a normal morning, you know. Oh god, Look at everybody this. else has been up this morning doing this, or oh, they're being zen over there. You you know, focus on what you're doing and try not to 
take all that on board and compare yourself in a way that leaves you feeling negative. Yeah. It takes the joy from what you're doing. And you might have done a fantastic job that night or might have done an average job, but absolutely loved every minute of being ringside and doing commentary. If you immediately go and look at, you know, one of the ones that's got 20 odd years experience and done it at the top level and go, mm, then you're immediately not going to feel, why should you not feel good about the bit you've done with the experience you've got and the skills you've got where you're at in that moment. Mm. So comparison in that way is not helpful, but you've got to watch your mind with it. Yeah. And the third one is having uh, as many positive petrol pumps as you can around you. Because I think when you're trying to achieve something in sport, the emotional and mental ups and downs are yeah. enormous the battles with injury, the business side of boxing is horrendous for everybody involved. So that'll do you in eventually. Um, and the media side is very difficult. It can be cutthroat. It can be a harsh industry. It can, you know, it's very difficult to break in because the, 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 you tend to use the same people all the time. So the, there's all of those. So it's hard, you know, and that's without just getting through your normal life where, mm. you know, the people you love might be struggling or there's health issues or whatever, you know, you've got normal life to deal with on top of that without aiming for big goals and trying to achieve stuff. So with that said, it's really important to have what I call positive petrol pumps, who are the people who, when your tank is getting low on that positive petrol it need, you can go to, whether it's a quick message, a chat, a phone call, you just, they're the, they know what to say to, to fill your yeah. positive tank up and you can go on. So take responsibility, don't compare yourself in a negative way and know who your positive petrol pumps are and you know keep them close. I echo that. I echo that. Positive people around you. The thing that I said, oh, we got that thing that made me laugh. The Zen, and then you've got the go get it people. I see that every day. Honestly, it's so relatable. Yeah. Um, look, Stacey, I, I appreciate you taking the time to join That's me today. Pleasure. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, her links will be done in the uh, YouTube video below where you can find her Instagram um, and all her socials tagged there. Um, you'll see her on another BBC soon. I know you just covered the Olympics. You just done a bit for the Olympics as well, didn't you? Yeah. The, the next thing, yeah. I think, obviously it depends when, when this goes out, but the next thing will be um, on the 28th, I'll be working for BBC Five Live, uh, presenting the coverage um, of the uh, – oh, I'm so excited for this one – Rhiannon Dixon and Terry Harper. Yeah, really. Massive I mean, the, the poor things, like, it's been... I interviewed him for the Five Live Boxing Pod, like, yes. whenever it was, back in June or July, I think it was, when they had the actual initial press conference for Catterall Pro Grey, um, because that's when it was meant to be happening. And, of course, that got put back. And it's just been moved and moved and rescheduled, and finally it's set to go ahead. So I'm really, really looking forward to it, because they're both, you know brilliant boxers are going to put on a great fight, but it's the great people as well. They've both got great stories behind them. They're just really, really uh, great fighters and people in every sense. So They're making, we're seeing the fights right. nowadays. I think boxing, we're lucky in the last couple of years where boxing's gifting us with uh, a lot of fights that we want to see across the board. Um, yeah. That probably is a, a, a promoter cohesion probably is a big part of that as well. As specifically, if I can speak about obviously the our UK promoters, um, but obviously in general, we, we're seeing the fights that we want to see, and I think it's giving van, fans value for money. That's making and people want to down as well. Because yes, that that's like the, the you know the, the the very top of the top. You know these undisputed titles and so on that are going on, but it's trickled down to many small hall shows as well. The likes that you will have commentated on that I commentate on with, with Fight Zone. Some of those fights top of the bill, have been unbelievable that I've had the immense privilege to sit mm -hmm. and either commentate on or co-commentate ringside interviews after, you know, all of that and, and be, you know, right in the thick of it has just been absolutely brilliant because you know, yeah. they've started to do, like, their own 5v5s, like, you know, it's, small... You're seeing that, yeah, you're seeing that like, right down big across fights the board. And, and, yeah. You know, sometimes the atmosphere of an English title fight or British title fight, or you know, sometimes the central area in those regions. I mean, it's unbelievable because because they live in such close proximity. To this, so there's real pride on the line, and both sets of fans, you know, are, are right behind them and really invested in their fight. You don't get people that have just gone because it's an event and an occasion. Mm. 
you know, nothing wrong with that. When you have Wembley, you're going to need that in order to fill it. But these are like really invested in their fighters and the atmospheres at some of these small old shows has been absolutely unbelievable. So it's just yeah. great to see, you know, from all levels, it's been brilliant. It's good. It's good. I know. I always talk about small shows. I have to give an honourable shout out to my friend Ellis Zoro, who's fighting in six weeks on a Nielsen card. Um, so he's looking to bounce back. So hopefully he does it. But um, you're, you're right. He's a great as, role model as well. He was fantastic. Yeah. The, the day reckoning out there, I interviewed him briefly and, uh, you know, we're just having a quick chat to him and to see the impact it had on the, the mm. local kids in his community and in his gym. Uh, yeah. It was it was just brilliant to see, and what an experience for him. He, he deserved it. It's, it's, it's yeah, that, yeah, that's that's what I mean. And these these cars do it, and they they're giving opportunities to fighters as well. I even say it trickles down to even like your your, your amateur shows locally that put on cards and they promote yeah. it as big cards. They're doing five v fives, so it's, yeah. it's going across the board now. Definitely, um, yeah. And what yeah. we're seeing is obviously. Uh, people are able to not just get out and be able to, they can watch the big fights, go to the stadiums, but they can also go to their local gyms, their local yeah. communities, support the local fighters, watch big cards there, make them fighters, you know, then fighters get into the experience of selling tickets. I think boxing's changed massively as a whole. Um, and it's very, very much filling out from uh, uh, the bottom to the top now. Yeah. So yeah. it's, that's probably a good point to end on as well. But Stacey, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Um, get some uh, knowledge and insight off of you just about see what you've done. Guys, if you did like the episode, make sure you like, share and subscribe. Um, Stacey Copeland, thank you very much for joining me. My name's Paolo. Pleasure. I'm Paolo from Boxing Corner Casuals Podcast. We'll be back with another episode again soon. Thank you.